Let's talk about Victoria Falls. Now, Victoria Falls is probably one of, or if not the most famous tourist attraction in the whole of the African continent. And it's got this accolade for good reasons. It's an astonishing sight and arguably one of the great natural wonders on this planet. But let's get one thing straight. It's an absolute bitch to photograph. The falls themselves straddle the border between Zambia and Zimbabwe in the central region of Southern Africa. At about 1.7 kilometers wide by 100 meters tall, this forms one of the largest waterfalls found anywhere on planet Earth. The very first consideration you've got to make when you visit there is where you're going to base yourself and you've got two choices. You've either got Livingston on the Zambia side or Victoria Falls, the town of Victoria Falls on the Zimbabwean side. For my visit last year, I stayed in Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. I don't know too much about Livingston, so I can't really advise on that, so I'll just stick to my experiences. But from what I know, they're pretty much even Stevens. So what makes Victoria Falls so damn difficult to get good pictures of? Well, the first thing is, the chasm that the falls actually fall into runs from east to west, whereas the falls themselves run from north to south, with all the main vantage points being based on the southern side looking north to the falls. Now, because it's based in the southern hemisphere, this means that for the majority of the day, the falls are backlit by the sun. So the lighting is absolutely terrible for most of the day and it really doesn't lend itself to effective landscape photography. Unfortunately, there's not too much you can do about that backlighting effect. That's just the way it is. You've got to learn to live with that. In terms of the actual vantage points that you can go to, I think there's a, in the region of 30 different fixed vantage points that you can go to spread across the Zimbabwean side and the Zambian side. Now, something that I found frustrating is a lot of these vantage points are at exactly the same height as the actual falls. So for me, I personally felt like it limited my composition possibilities. I kind of felt like I was taking the same photo over and over and over. The other condition that makes landscape photography of Victoria Falls so challenging is the spray that comes off the waterfall. Now, the amount of spray that you get depends on the time of year that you visit, but ultimately you'll get it year round. And I think getting drenched there to some extent is part of the experience, but it's a little bit frustrating when you're trying to take nice shots. Peak flow at the Zambezi is from December to May. And at this time, the waterfall is at its full force and pretty much the spray coming off it will totally obscure most of the vantage points. So in terms of the actual experience of the waterfall, it's probably a great time to kind of get a feel for its pure power. But in terms of photography, you can pretty much forget getting really nice shots at that time of the year. The, the mist is going to obscure your views and your equipment will be absolutely drenched. Now, opposite to that, if you go between September and November, I believe, that's when the river is at its lowest flow. And at this time of year, a lot of the actual falls that make up the wider waterfall will not be flowing at all. So you won't get a sense of the, the grandeur and the power of the waterfall at all. You will get totally unobscured views because the mist won't be there very much, but ultimately, I think you'll probably miss out on the spectacle and ultimately constrain the scale and effectiveness of your shots at that time of the year. A compromise therefore needs to be made and when I visited last year, I visited in July and that was spectacular. And for my research, the best time to visit is ultimately between May and August. This gives you the best of both worlds. The mist is greatly reduced compared to the peak flow so you can actually see the waterfalls. But the waterfalls haven't dried away to such an extent that their spectacle and scale is reduced. Regardless of what time of year you choose to visit these falls, you're going to need to think seriously about how you're going to protect your gear from the insane spray that you can encounter. Um, the obvious choice would be something like an umbrella, but realistically it's not that useful. You've only got two hands, plus a lot of the spray comes from directions you would not expect at all. What I used when I was there was simply a plastic bag and I just cut a hole out for my lens, popped that through and put a rubber band round it and I simply just shot through the actual plastic bag for certain locations where the spray was quite severe. 
I felt that was personally enough for me. I didn't need to invest in any kind of snazzy, high-tech, waterproof uh, casing for my camera or anything like that. So I recommend just going down that route and save yourself a bit of money. Make sure you keep your lens cap on your camera as well and only take it off when you go for that shot. Also make sure you carry plenty of microfiber cloths and tissues for cleaning the moisture which will inevitably find its way onto the front of your lens. One of the most important photographic features of these falls are the rainbows that are produced in the mists. And for me, I think they totally make or break many of the compositions at these falls. Now, when I visited, I was quite unlucky initially for the first hour or so of my visit. It was quite overcast, so I didn't have a lot of the rainbows and I was taking shots, but it kind of felt like something was missing. But luckily, the sun started to come out and the rainbows started to grow in strength and before I, I knew it, they were there. And ultimately I went back and took, retook a lot of those earlier shots and just the, the added rainbow in the same composition totally and utterly changed the shot for me. So really when you visit these falls, rainbows need to be an absolute priority. Now to get good rainbows, you need sunlight. So avoid overcast days. You wanna go when the sun is out. Also, you need the sun behind you, so you need to think carefully about the time of day you visit. In the morning, you'll see the best rainbows from the Zambia side, but as the day progresses, the rainbows will become visible from the Zimbabwean side. So in my experience, any time after sort of 2 p.m. in the afternoon is when the rainbows started to actually appear. Now, when I visited, I only had a very short window of time, I only had one day at the falls and ultimately I only spent the afternoon there during the relatively harsh light. One of my biggest regrets is not actually taking shots at golden hour around sunrise or sunset because I think that would have been spectacular. But I think a lot of careful planning would be needed to actually do that successfully. Firstly, the position of the rising and setting sun in relation to the actual waterfall changes quite considerably during the course of the year, so it requires some pre-planning using sun tracker apps on your mobile phone, for example. Using these, you can pre-visualize your compositions before you visit. For example, the rising sun rises quite favorably behind the main falls from about May to September, but from October to Feb, it rises before the park actually opens. For sunsets, you're probably best looking at the Zambian side or the eastern sector of the Zimbabwean side. The only problem with the Zimbabwean side is that, that eastern sector is quite far from the entrance gate, so you could be cutting it awfully fine with your time. You're probably better sticking with the Zambian side, which can produce amazing shots looking down along the gorge with the sun setting in the background. In terms of equipment, here are a few standout points. I think you need to be very, very careful of polarizer filters. They can totally destroy your rainbows, so if you're going to use those, think very carefully about it. Also, wide angle is the order of the day here. The sheer scale of these falls is difficult to comprehend until you're there, and really it's all about those wide angle shots. Sure, there's some interesting telephoto compositions that you can get in tight to the falls themselves, but ultimately, if you've just got the one camera body, you'll probably want to avoid doing too many lens switches due to the moisture and spray in the air. So, I would probably suggest just sticking to wide angle for the majority of your shots, actually. Tripods will only really be needed around sunrise or sunset when the light conditions drop off quite a lot or if you want to try and capture some movement in that falling water. It's not something that I personally did when I was there, but it could be quite effective. Ultimately, with the really bright African sun and most of your composition being dominated by bright white falling water, you can actually get very, very fast shutter speeds, which makes handheld shooting quite easy here. The falls themselves are situated about one kilometre out from the town of Victoria Falls, and I believe it's something similar on the Livingston side. So if you're going to take sunrise or sunset shots here, you need to think very carefully about this. It's not the kind of walk you want to be making early in the morning or late at night, because the falls themselves are situated right out in the middle of the African bush. So firstly, 
you've got quite a good chance that you'll bump into wild animals on that walk um, when they become active around these sort of times. So you don't want to be walking into an elephant or anything like that. But also crime is a serious consideration, particularly when you're carrying expensive gear. So I think if you're going to go to the falls during the early morning or late at night, definitely get a car or a taxi to take you right to the gate. Overall, I found Victoria Falls to be an absolutely stunning location to visit. It absolutely blew me away. But strangely, it's a place that I came back from and felt that my photos didn't really do it fully the justice it deserved. I, I, I felt like my images didn't fully capture the, the sheer power and enormity of what was before me. And I don't know whether that's just because I had a bad day or whether it's because a lot of these challenges just made shooting unrealistic. Maybe my expectations were too high. But I think if, you, if you're going to Victoria Falls, you need to go in with realistic expectations that this is a place that's ultimately incredibly special, but somewhere which is going to be incredibly difficult to get good shots of. I don't think many people realise how difficult it is to get effective shots of Victoria Falls. So if you're a landscape photographer and you happen to be visiting here anytime soon, hopefully this little video will come in some use for you. If you're not visiting there and you've got no intentions of visiting there, hopefully it's been interesting enough to keep you watching. It's a pretty iconic location that everyone knows, I think. But if you enjoyed overall, please consider liking. Um, also, I really like to hear your comments. So if you've got any comments on Victoria Falls' location or the advice I'm giving, I'll be really, really eager to hear those. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. Until next time, take care.